Wow, they're really excited to see you tonight. How are y'all doing? Look at this wonderfully renovated Great Hall. We have some beautiful places in Seattle. We're going to start off first uh, hearing from Roxanne. Are y'all good with that? Awesome. What do you got for us? Hello, everyone. It's so, I can't see you very well, but I hear you. And you sound wonderful. Well, I want to thank um, Edward. I don't know where Edward is. Walker, Candace Wilkinson, Megan Castillo, and everyone associated with making this evening possible. And I'm honored to be on the stage and in conversation with Nikita Oliver. And gratitude to the Suquamish, Duwamish, Nisqually, Muckleshoot nations whose unceded territory we are on. I want to mention that we're meeting on a date, September 11th, that is a day of infamy that some of you may not know very much about. 46 years ago tonight, one of the greatest democracies ever to exist in the Western Hemisphere was violently crushed. Its socialist president, Salvador Allende, murdered, throwing the Southern Hemisphere into darkness with brutal military dictatorships in power, from which it has never completely recovered. Indigenous peoples, the main losers. This coup against democracy was the work of the United States government and so many others around the world, as so many others around the world have been, are now, and will be if we don't do something about it. So that's what this book is about. The original book that I, I wrote, uh, it's about that um, Chile and hundreds of other um, devastating operations, military operations, secret sometimes by the United States. They're going on with bombs, drones, killing, maiming as we speak. So we are its citizens and we must stop it. So I am really excited about this book uh, for young people that uh, <clears throat> Jean Men Mendoza and Debbie Reese translated, adapted so beautifully. I give them all credit and I think Jean Mendoza might be here tonight. Is Jean here? Yeah. Hi, Jean. And Jean and I will be doing an event tomorrow night at Third Place Books about the book. So from the time I began writing this book in 2009, I had a dream of it becoming um, a, a book for young people as well. And that dream has come true. And um, I'm so happy about it. Um, grateful to Jean and Debbie and Beacon Press for the finished product. I had very little to do with it, except conceive the original idea. And I, I just wanted to start off with a question that um, I think of a lot, and um, uh, I know that teachers and parents do, is why is it so important that young people, even children, understand the true history of the United States. So let us think about that tonight as well as all the questions that Nikita has for me. Thank you. That's all right, show some love. I heard the little, should we clap? Well, I was uh, very moved reading this book. I've read both versions now, and um, it was informative, but also incredibly traumatizing. 
to think about the ways in which the United States and white settler colonialism and white supremacy has time and time again oppressed and aggressively attacked and made attempts to exterminate whole groups of people. And yet, here we are living in uh, Seattle, named after Chief Seals, uh, in a city named after Duwamish Chief, where we purposely bastardize his name every time we say it, um, placing an image on a symbol to make the city look like we're honoring the histories of the land and the peoples that we benefit from. And it was, it was a lot to process. And it made me think a lot about whole stories and truth. And so I started to Google you. <laughs> it's very millennial, millennial of me, huh? Um, to understand how you came to a place of this being the sort of work you did as an academic and historian, and to do it in such a way that it's useful for shifting culture. Books like this help us better understand the roots of this country and allow us to do what Angela Davis talked about, is get radical, which means to get to the root. So we can make cultural shifts, so eventually we can make policy shifts, so eventually we can make reparations. In this instance, returning the land back to, to the original peoples, right? So how did you get to doing this, you were born and raised in Oklahoma. I mean, I grew up in Indiana, and you don't know some of the people I grew up around. <laughs> so how did you arrive here? Well, yes, I grew up in rural Oklahoma, uh, Canadian County. I'm sure no one's ever heard of um, most of the sites of my childhood, um, but it's um, northwest of Oklahoma City, central Oklahoma. Um, Oklahoma is actually a very complex place, and I come from the most boring part of it, <laughs> actually, uh, where wheat farms, you know, everything was turned to wheat. Um, in western Oklahoma, wheat and oil and gas. Um, whereas the eastern, although there are the, um, the Plains peoples, uh, former land bases, reservations, which were allotted in the 1880s, the Southern Cheyenne Arapaho, um, the, um, um, the Comanches, Apaches. Um, and uh, so I was surrounded by native people um, where, where I grew up. My dad was a sharecropper. Uh, his father had owned land and lost it. This is a white settler. This is my father's uh, from the Scots-Irish borderlands, Indian killing, white settler, uh, class people that went from Kentucky to Missouri, kind of washed up in Oklahoma. Um, but his father was a veterinarian and owned land where I grew up. And uh, by the time my father, uh, by the time I was born, well, my father never owned land because my grandfather lost the land. So he was a sharecropper, mostly cotton, um, and uh, we were very, very poor and rural and moved around a lot in this one county. It was the former Southern Cheyenne Arapaho Reservation. So everything was segregated. Uh, there were black towns, uh, white towns, and native towns. And almost everyone, however, was Baptist. <laughs> But they had different, you know, white, white Baptist church and the uh, black Baptist church and the native Baptist churches. Um, so it was a very extremely provincial upbringing. Neither of my parents ever finished uh, school, uh, high school. And um, so in my family, um, we were the, the first, you know, to go to college. And so I don't know um, exactly, I guess because I was a reader, you know, I really, uh, not that we had that many books, our school library, I had my personal library at home right now is larger than the school library, <laughs> the school I went to for 12 years. Uh, but I read every book several times and, um, 
just had a lot of lucky breaks of uh, people who um, saw I liked to read and encouraged it and gave me other books to read and told me about things. And uh, so I, um, I really don't know how it was that I got the idea of even um, aspiring. I didn't really aspire to get a PhD in history. I, I didn't even know what that was. I basically wanted to get a degree to work at the telephone company and make more money than, than you do with a high school degree. So Midwest that, dreams. That, that was my largest aspiration at the time. But then other things happened. So, um, yeah, I, I've written three memoirs, so my life is kind of an open book, if you want to read. Pun intended. <laughs> So the first one, Red Dirt, Growing Up Oakey, covers this first 21 years of my life in Oklahoma. You know, the part that I find really interesting is um, I feel like I know a lot of academics, but none whose work as a community organizer, I mean, a few whose work as a community organizer, but mostly whose work as a community organizer is not useful to me. And one of the things that I found interesting in an interview that you did was you said you did not want to do work as an academic that would earn you tenure. You wanted to do work as, an, as a historian that would serve communities. And I think that is a drastically different perspective than how a lot of people approach their work in the ivory tower. Um, and I was thinking a lot about accountability in storytelling. And I won't lie, I felt a little bit like Maybe I shouldn't be the person on this stage asking you questions about a book about indigenous people. Um, as a person whose own heritage is from white settler colonials and formerly enslaved black peoples. And the, what it drove me to thinking about as a storyteller is what does it look like to be accountable as a historian to the communities whose story you're getting the privilege and opp opportunity to tell? It's a really important question. Um, I, <clears throat> I did this book as a, really as a history of the United States, um, attempting to take a, uh, an overall Native American perspective, which is, I say, in the author's note, is impossible. Uh, there are 500, uh, more or less, Native, um, Native nations and communities uh, across the continent. And uh, each are um, unique and, 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 and throughout the hemisphere. You know, it's really a, a hemisphere of villages. Um, and there are some elements that are in common and I was seeking what those are in the hemisphere and uh, follow the corn, you know, out of Mexico, the, diffusion of uh, the maize culture, um, creating uh, the most important um, agricultural uh, regions of the world, three, um, four of the seven uh, rise of uh, agricultural civilization. But without um, feudalism, forced labor, and without um, uh, without capitalism. So I, these were the things that interested me, um, but I built that upon um, 40 years of, um, <clears throat> of um, working with, um, I mean, I feel that all of this that I learned over time, you know, accumulated, um, and I had some important mentors like Vine Del Deloria Jr., uh, Howard Adams, uh, a Metis from uh, Saskatchewan, uh, Jack Forbes. Uh, these were, unfortunately, most historians were men back then. I might tell you that I went through from um, my entire university career uh, I had, I never had a woman or a person of color for a professor, only white males. Um, and so that was, um, that was standard at that time. 
uh, up until it's kind of standard now it too. <laughs> it's still kind Let's of standard. Let's not give them too much credit yet. But the responsibility that I <coughs> I acquired when I first got I felt like I got drafted. I felt like I got um, recruited into the, you know, the, in the wake of Wounded Knee, the Wounded Knee trials. Uh, I was in law school and I, I did get, literally get recruited by Vine Deloria and um, some of the other lawyers to work um, on the Wounded Knee legal um, cases. There were hundreds and hundreds of uh, misdemeanors and felony charges and by that time the leadership trials had uh, you know the ones that got a lot of attention had been done but then these thou you know thousands of others that um, had to be dealt with and um, most were Lakota but there were also you know there were allies that came there so there were some white black uh, other Native nations other than Lakota. And um, I had done my dissertation on the history of land tenure in New Mexico from pre-colonial times to the present. And um, this was mainly about the Pueblo Indians and their land tenure in New Mexico. So I told Vine Delore, you know, I'm not the right person. Uh, to, oh, they wanted me to be an expert witness, and I said, I'm not the right person because I don't know anything about the Sioux Treaty or Sioux history or anything else. I did Latin American history, you know, that's why I did New Mexico was colonized by the Spanish. And I said, I'm just not the right person. I, maybe I can find someone. And he said, well, you can, you can pick it up pretty fast probably, and he handed me a box. That's what lawyers school. always say. <laughs> you do, can go through this discovery pretty work. fast. <laughs> Hand you 5,000 pages. Yeah. Do your homework. So I did. And, um, and it was, uh, I felt very shaky because, you know, on the witness stand as an expert witness talking about things that I barely knew anything about. But um, I'll just describe the kind of... Um, uh, extraordinary experience it was. We were two weeks in Lincoln, Nebraska in the dead of winter and it really gets cold there. It was like 20 below zero. Um, and the Missouri River is right there. So this is the capital of Nebraska. It's where the federal court is and where we were doing a um, motion to dismiss uh, 300 cases based on the Sioux Treaty. So it was a test of the treaty. Um, the 1868 treaty had a, a portion that said that um, any, um, anyone uh, who committed a crime on, on Sioux Reservation, the Great Sioux Nation, um, would be that if it was a white person, the, they, the Sioux could choose to turn them over you know, to the Federals government or put them on trial if it was a native person they could put them on trial that the federal government had no right to try these um, try these people um, so it was a two-week session and hundreds probably about 700 Lakotas came down and um, pitched their teepees along the Missouri River there they're used to the cold weather and the way we organized it, there were about 10 lawyers. Um, Binder Loria was the main one, and then there were all these other lawyers, uh, all of them pro bono, working on these cases. And we would um, plan the next day, uh, going down there, first of all, they would cook, you know, we would be fed by the Lakota people. And then there was this mass meeting, and this is how they come to decisions, and they would discuss what we would do the next day, who would testify, who would be an expert witness, um, and the lawyers would take notes and figure out, go back to the hotel then, where we were staying in the hotel, and figure out how to implement the wishes of the 700 
people in discussion. So this is the decision. That is a very um, challenging form of accountability. Yeah. You know, that as, you know, as a lawyer, I couldn't imagine sitting in a room with 700 people and trying to figure out, okay, so y'all tell me I need to use this witness. Yup. <laughs> I got you. I'm going to figure that out tomorrow. Um, but it's also a beautiful example of what it looks like to be an accomplice and an ally. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to thinking that simply because you have this degree and you've been given this bar license that somehow you know what's right. I think it also is an example of what does it look like? You know, one of the things that was shocking to me uh, reading this youth version um, was to think about all the ways in which sovereign nations who had their own ways of uh, governing and constructing themselves and running their society, uh, how disrespected that way of being was. Right. And this to me sounds like a way of honoring that even in relationship to a process, like, cause let's not play with ourselves. Courts don't want you to honor that relationship even when it comes to your clients. A really like revolutionary way, a radical way to shift the power paradigm. So in that, in that context, um, we're, we're very progressive here in Seattle. <laughs> yes, faux progressive. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and um, yes, you feel me. Um, I'm wondering, was there a time in the work that you did in partnering with Native nations where you were called out for maybe not doing things the way they wanted and how did you respond to it? Because I feel like in Seattle, we often get told by communities that actually doesn't honor our way of being. And um, I think we need to be instructed on how do you respond? What is the restorative and reparative way when a community asks you to honor their way? Um, and how can you really be progressive in doing that? Yeah, I um, I can't recall ever. Um, I you know I learned very early. I was married to a, a Acoma Pueblo a native person, Simon Ortiz, and um, I certainly learned they were a very traditional family that um, you didn't even consider. You didn't go to their ceremonies. You know if you weren't. Pueblo, I mean, even if you were another native, um, uh, even another tribe, um, they're, they're very um, secretive about their ceremonies. So I, I learned a protocol, and I guess I was raised with a great deal of um, a sense of um, not... Uh, I don't know, not, not um, understanding boundaries, you know, not to cross. And, and that was very restrictive in some ways, but it also, you know, respect, the uh, certain kind of respect. So it never did, it didn't bother me at all. I didn't feel excluded or, you know, it's not something I, I have never participated. One thing I, I, uh, draw the line at us, I don't participate in any ceremonies, uh, even when I am invited. Um, I just uh, don't feel it's appropriate um, for me. Um, so I, 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 I do not. And so for me, it's a, it's a um, how can I serve, um, be of service, you know, to that community. And I, almost every, I think every book and every article I've written has been initiated by being asked, you know, asked a, a question. Um, but I also, you know, after, right after, at the same time as this 1974 treaty hearing, uh, the International Indian Treaty Council was formed. Mm. Um, the elders, the Lakota elders had asked uh, the young people to take um, the treaty. Um, by the way, we lost the case. I didn't, <laughs> we, we lost the, oh. the Supreme Court 
denied. And, and the Supreme Court said, you, um, uh, you need to, uh, the, that the United States government can, cannot decide against itself. You, and this judge said, you need to go to um, an international body. So um, the elders wanted us to take, uh, chose some of us that, you know, they wanted us to take, go research this and see if we could go to the world court, see if we could do this or that. And none of us knew anything about any of this. So we, we learned to, to do that. So that I did for throughout the 80s, you know, I was doing this international work. And now there's a huge uh, indigenous caucus you may know about. And the, the um, uh, in 2007, after 40 years of that work, we got the, um, we got the, uh, um, uh, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2007. So, you know, then that, the next stage of that is to try to, to get a, you know, work on a treaty and also work up some uh, charges of genocide um, that, uh, so that's, that's the main actual, you know, work rather than community work that I've done. Yeah, and you know what I love about that story and like the, the core being there is you were asked to do and didn't perceive that you had a right to do for. And that for me is an important principle in, in the work that I do, even in partnering with young people who are fighting to exit the criminal legal system um, and fighting to dismantle it, is really striving to do work that is led by those most impacted by an issue. Yeah. And that requires that you, you listen and you're available and you're present, but you don't assume that you get to decide the direction. You wait till you're asked. Right. And there, that's a beautiful lesson. Um, one of the things that uh, was so important about reading this book was the strength that was portrayed of Native peoples. I feel like the history I was taught in high school was, um, you know, like good intention, white settlers fleeing prosecution or persecution uh, and prosecution. I'm sure both were happening, make their way to the United States to be free, and they meet Indian people on the shore, and they become friends, and then they're not friends, and then white people try to deliver freedom. <laughs> what was I taught? This was AP classes. My goodness. Um, but what was... As, as traumatic as reading this was in terms of like just the genocide and the continuous attempts of the United States towards extermination was the resilience, the strength, and the continuing to resurge the fight, but also an attempt to preserve culture. I'm a cultural worker and I'm an artist and I believe that like preserving our culture is so key. Um, but I got to the end of the book and I finished with the Water is Life conclusion. And I was like, yeah, we did that. And I was thinking about all the things Seattle did. And then it was like, but what do we do next? And I'm wondering, what are the things that you hope this book, um, and the, well, the book that you wrote, and the book that was inspired, um, what are you hoping young people are inspired to be a part of or do? Because uh, this is reparations, land restitution is a huge call. And it, there's so many steps to getting to that. Um, what's your hope? Well, uh, you know, this book, um, when I published mine in 2014, um, Standing Rock hadn't happened yet. And um, fortunately, you know, the, this could be added. Uh, Jean and, and Debbie <clears throat> were able to add material that was, you know, what happened. Because things happen all the time, you know. and I. I tried to make the first book not too presentous so that it was dated, but to keep it, you know, um, a, uh, but Standing Rock was such a um, extraordinarily important and remains uh, an important, um, uh, not really an event, but a, um, 
a sea change in, um, I don't know if you saw on television the, um, uh, the vets, uh, Vietnam and Iraq vets and Veterans for Peace who asked for uh, forgiveness for uh, what the military had done in the past to the Lakota people. That was the most extraordinary thing I never thought I would see in my lifetime. Um, uh, uh, something at that level of um, bringing history to the present and linking it up with um, water. And, you know, the denial of water, water being life, is uh, when it's a government that's preventing uh, the clean water, that is ge genocide, you know, that fits into the genocide convention of, uh, of uh, creating conditions uh, that make it impossible for the people to continue as a people. That's the real definition of, uh, of what genocide um, in the Genocide Convention is. So, um, what was your question? <laughs> I love it, the historian brain. What's your hope? Oh, my hope, yes, oh, okay. Hope, I'm, yes. I guess I'm avoiding, I'm avoiding that. What is my hope? Uh, it's kind of hard to be hopeful these days, isn't it? Um, it, um, it's, it really feels like uphill, and um, especially, I think, for us old veterans, and I'm sure there are many here, um, as Seattle was certainly on the map for 60s uprisings of Native peoples and Black Panthers up here and, um, uh, and students and um, this feeling that uh, everything that was accomplished with so much struggle and so much sacrifice um, and people's lives is just going backwards, backwards, just getting unwound and so I think it's, um, it, and then for younger people who are looking, you know, have a horizon and seeing the climate uh, crisis. But I do, th I, I do think we need to, um, to stop and um, uh, listen, and what is that sound, <laughs> is the, um, is this history that is bubbling up and becoming apparent to people what to do with that, you know? So I guess I saw this, this book as a way of, um, not a handbook so much as a guide, a con contextualizing how to deal with it and how to also see that it, it holds within it a much better future than the one that hangs on to, you know, settler colonial narratives of um, the great pioneers of the, you know, the, the um, uh, perfect constitution, of course, you know, uh, slave owners make perfect constitutions. Isn't that logical? I say. <laughs> Indian killing slave owners. I yeah. had some comments about patriarchy and white men to go along with that, but <laughs> I'll keep them to myself, kind of. <laughs> you know, I think that that's a great place. I'm getting ready to open the mics up for questions, and um, I know they're going to tell you that we need to prioritize young people, but I'm going to emphasize prioritizing young people's questions first. But the, you talking about um, us getting to the root of things, and having that bubble up to the surface. You know, I was thinking about as painful as it is to learn true history, how much more pain and paralysis do we leave ourselves in when we live in a lie? And um, as a boxer, I know that there is a certain amount of pain required <laughs> to get to that next level. Um, I know that, you know, your body sometimes is hurting before it is stronger. And I think as a nation, we really have got to get comfortable with delving into this very painful history, experience that pain, move through it so we can actually be stronger and healthier. And I think material like this uh, is so important for young people, but I think it's important for all people. And living in a city, 
uh, if I'm honest, that is 65% white, what it means for white people to move through that pain of understanding and identifying what they benefit from. You know, because we often hear, well, I didn't do it, like that happened in history. Well, history is still now. And if we're not willing to grapple with the things that we benefit from, then we're being silent, which means we're being complacent. And it is on us to do what is right. And I always say justice is just us being just us. So if we want to be just, if we want to do the right thing, we are really gonna have to be willing to dig into the roots of how this whole thing started and then be willing to do the work to repair it. And I believe that young people who have been at the forefront of every world-changing social movement are really gonna be the ones that, that lead us in that direction. So with that. Well, I wanna give a shout out to for what I think are the most important people, adults in the world and that is teachers and librarians. Yes, shout out the educators and librarians. <laughs> and boy, do you ever have a, a task in front of you, how to, within those systems that control the education system, how can you be as subversive as possible? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. If you're an educator in the room, we're asking you to raise your hand. Oh, I didn't mean it, but yeah. Identify all these educators, y'all. Yes, thank you for that. Um, so we're going to open the mics up for questions. We want to prioritize uh, youth and young people first, and I think they're going to give you some more instructions. you think should be um, heard tonight. And then um, after the program, there will be book signing down in the lobby, and I hope um, some of you will, will join us down there. Thank you. Give it up for our town hall staff, y'all. <laughs> Go ahead, Alex, or whomever is first. It's me again. I'm here. Um, <laughs> Uh, we had a request for the lights to be brought up just a little bit. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was wondering what you think, um, how, how young should these horrible things that happened, um, how, 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 how young should we teach children in school about these things? Because while it's, it's very important that they learn, I think it also takes a level of emotional maturity to get through that. And it takes a lot of guidance, especially when they're young, and how much of that teachers can provide. So um, how, how, when do you think we should start teaching these concepts to children in school? It's really a good question. Um, I think it's not the age so much. I think it can start even, you know, in kindergarten or at home, you know, even before school, that the choice in the past has been to, um, it has been this concept of multiculturalism, which I think is a neoliberal um, uh, invention in order to contra uh, contradict the real uh, revolutionary um, movements of the 1960s that, you know, the Red Power and Black Power, um, Puerto Rican independence, these women's, very militant women's liberation movements um, that demanded clarity and truth and we didn't know we didn't know as much then as can be known now I didn't know as much then but I think that what what then developed in the 70s and 80s is this what have different um, oppressed groups of people contributed to the greatness of the United States 
you know, and so we had corn, beans, and squash, and canoes, and parkas, and, you know, for Native people. And we had, um, uh, it wasn't really, well, you know, the idea of uh, Christmas addicts dying in the revolution uh, for African Americans, or having built, you know, built Washington, D.C., and actually built the capitalist economy of the United States, the labor, um, and uh, so on. You know, this, these, these contributions, or women contributing and doing women's history, what did, the greatness of the country was always assumed. You know, the, this greatness that, that existed and who contributed to it. And I think that that got so far away then from, but it's still kind of in the mentality of parents and teachers uh, who think we have to, we have to give something positive. You can't just be negative. But what's positive is the resistance. You know, the resistance of oppressed peoples. And, and the resistance of, say, John Brown you know, is a, 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 what I would consider a model for uh, white alliance, <laughs> alliancehood. And um, so that resistance is, is, is positive. And I think for, um, there's some slippage in that, even in Nat Native American communities that, well, you know, why emphasize um, Sitting Bull and Tecumseh, and you know, these were people who picked up arms and fought against the United States and saw the United States as an implacable enemy and predicted almost everything that's happened today. Um, Crazy Horse said, um, you know, they, they want to privatize the land. What will be next? The water and the sky? Well, yes, that's what's next with capitalism. So I think that's what we have to pull out, and I tried to do in the book, and I think the Young People's Book does it even, even better for, for young people. Um, these, you know, these positives being what, what the ancestors have done and what can be done today in, in terms of, of um, resistance. So resistance is a positive, not a negative. Um, and rather than a contribution, I, I don't want to think that anything I ever do contributes to one iota to strengthening what the United States is as it is now, you know, of making it, um, making it more imperialist, more militaristic, because it, that's its direction, you know, it's not. So we have to think of how, I think also uh, the importance of, of um, Native American land and Native American demands is, how do we begin to deconstruct the United States, you know, as, um, as, as an entity, and really think in, in those positive, I consider that positive thinking, you know, <laughs> negative. <laughs> and I would just add to that, I don't think it's ever too early to teach children the truth. We teach them the lie almost immediately. You know, we have, we have young children who from a very young age will choose a doll that doesn't look like them because they were already taught that the way they look is a problem. So we're teaching them the messages we don't want them to have just by virtue of them being in society. So I don't think it's ever too early to start teaching them the messages and the truth history that we want them to have now, you know? Appreciate your question. We'll come to this side and then we'll come back to this side. What's up? Um, what do you think is the most important um, thing about learning our history? What do, you, what do you think is the most important thing about learning our history? The most important thing about learning our history? Mm -hmm. I think it's um, the most important thing is that 
children like yourself, young people, uh, ask questions that you push your teacher to tell you the truth. And you try, you know, you, you, you kind of know when someone's not telling you everything. I remember when I was uh, maybe a little bit older than you, but I couldn't figure out what the First World War was about, and no one seemed to be able to explain it. <laughs> and <laughs> I just couldn't figure out what it was about, and I was really interested because, you know, I, I, I lived at a time when there were still veterans from the First World War, and even they, they couldn't figure it out. <laughs> so then someone said to me, and she turned out to be a, a socialist, of course, she says, <laughs> It was a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. And I said, ah, that makes sense, because I knew what rich and poor was about. And it made perfect sense then. And then I could build upon that and really see what a horror it was, you know, I mean, uh, in terms of, of empire uh, and genocide. It's what it was really about. Um, and it led to fascism. So, so you build, you know, you, you force your teacher, because you're, you're the um, person in charge, you know, this, this person teaching you is, has a duty to you to tell you the truth. See, the young people have the good questions. Yeah. It's all you. All right, so I'm going to preface this by saying that my question is probably going to make a lot of people really unhappy with me. But I try to think of myself as a pragmatic idealist rather than just an idealist. So at the very beginning, you brought up the idea of returning native lands to native people. But at the moment, there are several million people living in Seattle. Are you proposing that we relocate all of the non-native people from Seattle to somewhere else? Where else? What? It, it's, it's a great idea, but it does not seem realistic to me. So how can we make reparations while also, and make, make reparations must be about making amends and changing the future, not about trying to change or rewrite the past or deny the present, no matter how distasteful the latter. How can we make reparations while also acknowledging reality? Good questions. Important um, to understand what uh, is meant by um, restoration of, of uh, native land. The continent was, um, there are treaties between Native people and the U.S. government, and there were treaties with the British before that, um, and treaties with the Spanish, and, the, and that Native people were, were nations. Um, they were on, you know, on the defensive being attacked by outsiders coming in, but they recognized um, not all treaties, but the legitimate treaties that were um, agreed to by the kind of consensus form uh, that was practiced, and not just some, you know, for some treaties, they would just drag a couple of uh, uh, Native men out and, you know, say, put your mark here, and, you know, it, it was a paper treaty. It was, it was a, well, for instance, the Treaty of Ochota, that um, forced, forcibly relocated the Cherokee Nation, they actually um, closed down the Cherokee newspaper. They locked the leaders in a, um, uh, in a building, padlocked them, or whatever locks they had at the time, by guards, and, and chose a few people to sign that, you know, that removal treaty. So that is an illegitimate treaty. The land, uh, most of it, I mean, there are places like um, Palm Springs, uh, Salamanca, New York, Denver, Colorado, Albuquerque, and quite a few um, that are, uh, were leased, you know, cities that were leased 
And those claims have been, uh, in the last 40 years, have been um, uh, where the lease payments were like a dollar a year or something, and, and the settlers stopped paying a long time ago. So there's one documentary on Salamanca, which goes through that process. So a lot of those claims have been settled um, so that the payments are more, you know, up to date and, and all for, but it's still, you know, it's still leased land. It's not, you know, it, it, um, land titles all over New Mexico are, are very unclear. There's hardly any clear land titles at all there. So it's a very shaky ground because of, uh, uh, of the kind of settlement. But, you know, there are, there are these uh, millions of acres of land under the federal government trust. Almost all of that land was taken uh, without treaty and is still under federal government and people don't live there, uh, and including the national parks. These are sacred areas that were um, annexed. Uh, Obviously, Yosemite or Yellowstone, these places obviously are sacred areas to Native people. And so the claim, as I put in the, you know, the last part of uh, the book, is that um, these, everything under federal control and state control uh, should be returned to Native people. And there are no people involved who have to be removed. I would also add, in addition, that there's land that could be returned that people are not on, is that the assumption is that Native people, and that question is that Native people will treat the people who live here now the same way the people who stole the land treated the Native people. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that that's how it would go down. I'm not sure Native people would be as, would, some people might want some, but I don't think Native people would be as heartless in the way that it went down in terms of the land being stolen. Um, and so I think we also would need to work from the assumption that there is a possibility of, of reconciliation just in the, the act of returning. Um, in addition to obviously there's land that nobody lives on that could be returned. Yeah, and the national parks, I mean, why, why not have uh, the particular Native nation um, like the, um, uh, the Cheyenne uh, controlling Yellowstone or the, you know, the Central um, Valley people of uh, California controlling Yosemite as they did before, rather than park rangers. I mean, it's true that when they have ceremonies, they would probably close the gates at certain times like Taos does with its, you know, Blue Lake area that they uh, was, did fight for and got returned. Uh, but that's okay too. Sometimes they close it, you know, because the federal government does too if there's a fire or something. So to, um, for Native people to have agency is, is not something taken away from white people. It's a transfer from the federal government to Native nations. I think this will be the last question, so make it good. Okay. Um, I know that you wrote another book that was inspired by some of the work that you had started in the Indigenous People's History of the United States, States which was loaded, a uh, cultural history of the Second Amendment, um, which is also a profoundly fascinating book for everyone. Shout out to it. I was wondering, just because you by necessity have to cover so much history and so many different stories and so many perspectives like is there something that that you wished that you could have included or gone deeper into or or something like that that you just weren't able to get into the book into loaded uh sorry into indigenous people's history oh. of the united states well, yeah, in, an indigenous people's history of the United States is part of a wonderful uh, series of um, Beacon Press revisioning American history. It was actually um, based on um, 
a concept that Howard Zinn came up with. He published his uh, People's History of the United States with Beacon Press in 1980. Beacon Press is, uh, any Unitarians here? Ah, the Unitarians are here. Beacon Press is owned by the Unitarians, and they thank you for coming. And it's a very ethical press. It was founded as an abolitionist press in the 19th century. And um, so he published, and then his book took off, and they sold it to Penguin, and you know it became bestseller and classic and everything. Uh, but before he passed away, um, Beacon Press, of course, is on Beacon Hill in, in Boston, Massachusetts, and he uh, taught there. He, he came to the editors, and he suggested that they do this uh, different people's histories of the United States. So mine, I think, was the first. Uh, there's a queer history of the United States. There's uh, in the works um, uh, a uh, um, well, one uh, a, a Lat uh, Latino uh, and black history of the United States, a black women's history. It could go on endlessly revisioning uh, American history. So the way it was conceived is that it would be by you know, historians, scholars, like Howard Zinn. Um, uh, and it would be very solid, but it also written for a general audience and not um, you know, an academic scholarly book with two um, you know, just laden with footnotes and, and so forth. And, so, um, and, and not too long, under 300 pages. So that's the model I worked within, and it was very difficult, let me tell you, because um, um, I could have made it a thousand page book, and probably no one would read it, you know. Uh, <laughs> but I had to really work, and I think it, um, it makes it much more effective that I, it ended up taking me about seven years to write this book mainly putting it off because it was just really hard <laughs> to do. But so that was the model. Um, there are lots of things I, I've wanted to write on. I, it's always, you know, really writing a book is, um, is really a uh, difficult process. Um, it seems like when I start writing an article, it turns into a book, and then I have seven more years of my life. I don't have that many years left. But the, the book I've been wanting to write for a long, long time, I am at work on, and I have a contract with Beacon for it, and it's a uh, nation of immigrants, the concept of the nation of immigrants. So um, that's, that's I, I've wanted to deal with settler colonialism in, um, in the context of what that means about immigration. Because, you know, immigration as such didn't really begin until the 1870s. Immigration as such, where there were immigration laws. There were none. Right. Um, millions of Irish came, just got off boats. They, there, was, there were no immigration laws, the, uh, the famine. So they were recruiting settlers all the time, you know, boatloads uh, just to, populate and you know fill the machine especially the industrial revolution so uh what does that mean you know immigration and settler you could the simple form is you know um an immigrant who comes now could can choose to be a settler or choose to be uh part of the resistance to settler colonialism thank you so, I just want to remember Jean Mendoza and Debbie Reese and their contribution to making this book even possible. Jean, will you just stand up one more time? And I want to give y'all a, like, I like action points. So just a few things you could be doing. Uh, one is, if you feel so called, you could pay rent to the Duwamish. Uh, Alex, who spoke up here, is a part of uh, Clear Sky Youth Council, is that correct? 
Yes, Clear Sky Youth Council, you can support them and the work that they're doing. You can show up for Fridays for Future at City Hall at 1 p.m. and support our youth that are fighting against the climate crisis. And October 9th is Indigenous Peoples Day. You could take that day off in resistance to settler colonialism and capitalism and show up and march and show your support for our sovereign native nations and pay your respects, build some relationships, and get in the position to be asked to do things to support our relatives. So those are a few action items that we can do. And I just want to thank Town Hall, and I do believe there's going to be a book signing downstairs. I'm really sorry. I appreciate you. Show some love to our patient. Didn't get to ask a question. But I thank you for being here, and one more round of applause for all of you.